Hi, good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks very much for uh, uh, attending our most recent installment of our um, IEEE San Diego Big Chapter uh, webinar. So today we're absolutely delighted to have um, uh, uh, Mehul Shroff from uh, uh, NXP Semiconductors give a talk on um, uh, design technology optimization for reliability and quality in advanced nodes. So um, just um, you know, hope everyone's staying well uh, in light of the pandemic. And uh, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, let's get started. So uh, just a brief uh, bio about Mehul. So uh, Mehul um, is uh, based in Austin, Texas, in the Silicon Reliability uh, uh, Group. Uh, is primarily focused on advanced CMOS and uh, non-volatile memory technologies. Uh, he is um, an industry veteran with uh, over 25 years of experience in, uh, in the industry doing process development, uh, reliability, product development, and so forth. Very experienced. Um, his prior experience uh, involves uh, process integration, device en integ engineering and manufacturing, tech transfer and development, module development, yield engineering, test vehicles, test structures, and so forth. So he's um, clearly one of um, um, the key um, members of NXP's uh, new technology bring up. So uh, his current interests are focused on reliability tools and methodologies and designed for reliability. Um, he has um, graduate degrees in chemical engineering as well as software engineering. So, um, uh, you know, just on a little bit of a personal note, um, you know, um, since I have joined uh, NXP, uh, Mehul um, has been, you know, um, easily been my go to guy in anything reliability relate related and I'm just absolutely flattered that uh, um, to, to have him as a colleague. Uh, anyways, um, uh, the way we're going to uh, proceed with this uh, talk, um, we are going to um, have uh, an intermission halfway through the talk to take questions. If um, and then have another one at the conclusion of the, the, the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please type it in the Q&A box um, uh, that you see in, in the WebEx on the right side of your screen. And, uh, um, you know, um, well, we should have pl plenty of time to uh, address your questions. OK, so with that said, um, oh, yeah, one other thing I was going to mention, um, this talk is an encore uh, of what was recently pr uh, presented at uh, um, at the SPIE uh, uh, virtual conference that was held back in mid-February. OK, well, Mehul, a uh, pleasure to have you um, uh, do this uh, webinar for us. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Alvin and Jeff, and thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm glad to be here and have a chance to talk about this. So, so the title of the talk is Design Technology Co-Optimization for Reliability and Quality in Advanced Nodes. And, and Alvin was very kind to work with me on putting this together and, and, and be a co-author. So this is as much Alvin's work as it is mine. Okay, so uh, at a high level, the, 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 the contents are just, an, just a brief introduction of, of the topic and followed by an overview of intrinsic reliability, extrinsic reliability, and product quality, after which uh, we'll, we'll probably pause for questions if there are any. And then I'll, I'll get into a handful of key challenges in advanced nodes, certainly not an exhaustive list but just a few few ones to ho hopefully give the audience a flavor of what what we're dealing with and finally then conclude the talk so to to start um let's let's begin by talking about what dtco means right so it's it's a uh, it's really just a framework and and what it means and it's it's a fancy term for basically saying hey Everyone involved in, in designing and building and testing semiconductor devices should really be talking to each other, talking early and talking often. And in general, you know, it would seem like a good idea, but I know from my personal experience on older generation technologies, like, you know, 90 or even before that, when we did this, you know, the designers weren't in the picture or they were doing their own thing. The product guys weren't involved until the products actually came out of the fab. And so it was somewhat disjointed and we only talked if there were crises or questions or issues. And, and so it would seem that this would be a good idea, but, but on, on the advanced nodes, it's absolutely critical for a variety of reasons. Um, for instance, you know, as, as you all know, we have novel transistor architectures, FinFETs and FTSOI moving on to nanosheets and, and, and 
various other structures that are being being discussed. Uh, there's a lot of new materials. Uh, we're looking at all corners of the periodic table to find things to scale with. Products are much more complex in, in their architecture, their contents and their functionality. A, a lot of digital and analog, um, you know, the off used term system on a chip, which has replaced just a chip um, now. There's, there's you know, much more competition, which is a good thing, but that also leads to faster time to market and, and that often requires concurrent technology and design development. And, and as semiconductor applications uh, become more widespread and pervasive, and, and, and particularly in, in applications such as automotive and avionics, there are very stringent quality and reliability requirements. So with all of this put together, it, it's, it's imperative that the various groups and teams involved in in technology and product development engage with each other early and often. Historically, it would be the foundry doing the technology development and handing handing out a PDK to a fabulous design company that would then go off and, and make chips using the PDK. But it's no longer a one-way communication because there's a lot of knowledge and information that the fabulous company can have or obtain on the products that the foundry doesn't have access to the fabulous company making the chip will also have an, an idea of market requirements that the foundry may not have access to so a lot of this information from the fabulous company needs to then go back to the foundry to optimize the technology and and then there are things that you learn specifically from products that again the foundries typically don't see which we'll touch upon a little later in the talk and so, so with that, there, there needs to be a two-way and a multi-way communication. Another factor that comes into play is design is increasingly globalized and, and you have cases where some IP is designed internally within a company, some IP is purchased externally from uh, specialized IP design companies. And, and so getting all of those things lined up and working as, as needed takes a lot more discussion and interaction with with the with the key teams involved in, in bringing up technologies and products. So moving on, um, so let's talk a little bit about quality and reliability. So these are terms that are often used interchangeably, and while they are related, they're not the same. So quality is really just a measure of whether the device performs its intended function within the performance specification at a particular point in time. Reliability, on the other hand, may be thought of as quality over time, but often includes other elements, such as the availability of the system, the probability of successfully completing the intended function, the durability, the dependability, and then obviously the quality over time. So with that, it's 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 you have to look at us several other things when it comes to reliability beyond just whether the part is working or not working. And for semiconductor devices, quality, the overall quality is, is represented by the bathtub curve, which, which is fairly well known and has been around for a long time. And, and what, what we see with, with that is, is typically an early failure rate that reduces over time and then increases towards the end of life or late life of the product. And this is really based on three components. So the first one is the is the early failure rate, which is essentially latent defects and infant mortality, which tend to be high early on in the field life and, and decrease over time as the failing parts are weeded out. Now, the good news is this can actually be screened inside the, the design company's um, um, barrier or the wall in, in, um, in, in the, with, with various screening techniques, the customer can be protected from these failures. The next category is constant or random failures that occur over time and are usually fairly fairly steady in terms of uh, failure rates. And these include things like soft errors, latch up, ESD, et cetera. The third component is the intrinsic reliability, which is really the collection of wear out mechanisms that cause chips to fail. And they tend to be low initially and fail late in life. And, and these are often managed through various modeling and design mitigation techniques which again we'll talk about a little bit later so when you when you when you combine the three and, and add them up you get you get the backed up curve which is 
shown by the blue blue curve here. So, so while intrinsic reliability is really the, the, the mode that fails at the end, it's typically assessed early on during technology development and as part of technology qualification. So I'll speak to that first and then I'll, I'll touch upon extrinsic reliability and product quality. So intrinsic reliability is handled through a set of certification criteria. Um, and so here are some examples for three, three broad categories, consumer, industrial, and automotive. And as can be imagined, there tends to be a little higher tolerance for failures for consumer and even for industrial compared to automotive. And there are several different elements that are combined in the certification criteria. So the failure fraction, which is typically expressed as PPM parts per million, uh, the junction temperature, which is the operating temperature uh, of the chip in the field, and, and there's a minimum and a maximum. So it's, it's a range of temperatures within which the chip is expected to operate. Uh, the supply voltage, and so for certification, there is some tolerance given to the fact that there might be spikes or transients that exceed the nominal voltage. So it's typically in the five to ten percent range. The actual field lifetime, so how long is the part operating or operational in the field? The duty cycle, so during the field lifetime, how how long is the part powered? And and so the 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 multiple of these two ends up being what the actual product on time is. Now here, especially in the case of automotive, we're seeing this increase quite a bit due to the advent of autonomous and electric vehicles. So historically, it used to be the case where the chip was powered only when the car was driven, and typically that would be about 10, maybe 20% of the time at most, at least for passenger vehicles and commercial vehicles might be longer. But now with the move to autonomous and electric vehicles, and, and the chip really acting as the brains of the car. So essentially a car is now becoming a computer on wheels. The chip is often on when the car isn't being driven because it's, it's, it's talking to the network, giving and receiving location information or traffic information. Um, it's you know, talking to other cars in the vicinity to make sure that their crash avoidance systems can can be activated when needed, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of action on the chip, even when the car is not being driven. So that significantly increases the duration, the power duration of the chip. And that that brings its own set of reliability challenges. So another thing that's used in 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 um, certifying technologies is the concept of a mission profile. And this is particularly relevant for automotive applications. So wh what a mission profile is, is essentially a table as shown here by the example, which is the, the time spent by the chip at various temperatures over the course of its lifetime. So in this case, for example, the chip may be in a car that's operation, operational for say, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, some, something like that. But the actual lifetime might be something, something smaller and then th this, Example, it's 20,000 hours, so a little over two years. Um, and, and what this can be, and this is again, this is information that the foundry may not have a priori, but it's something that the, the, the company designing the chip will have. And will use that in their design flow to, to appropriately design and margin the product. So, for example, you want to make sure that. In terms of design simulations, you have expected functionality at cold and hot. Or, or that reliability assessments appropriately take take the mission profile into account. Now, what what we can do with this is is use that to 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 um, calculate the exact requirements per per reliability mode. So the way that works is essentially this: um, by by an arena scaling of the of the certification temperature versus the actual. Uh, uh, junction temperature each of these and and with the activation energy of each reliability mode we can calculate the effective time for for a certification temperature and, and the same calculation can be done in reverse where you can calculate the effective temperature for a fixed certification time and so depending on the activation energy you can get a range of different times for the same mission profile which ends up generating a curve like this when plotted versus activation energy so, so in this case, um, for these three examples, we have these times that just are 
the, the corresponding points on this plot. And, and so where this is useful is that each reliability mode has its own activation energy. And that can be used to, to define the certification requirement based on that mode. So rather than having a one size fits all certification as in say 20,000 years, what we really see is that for a high activation energy mode, for example, electro migration really need you know, a much shorter time. Again, at, at, at a particular temperature. So this is obviously relative. Now, if you did this at say a, a completely different temperature at 25 C, the curve would go the other way. Um, or as you go lower in, in activation energy in this case, uh, it, it rises up. Now, now, one quick comment here is that if the activation energy were zero, i.e. there is no temperature sensitivity, then, then the time would just collapse to 20,000 hours because then it doesn't matter what time you spend at what temperature, it's all the same. So that's that's a good sanity check for the calculations. Now, in addition for certification, we can we can use a, a D rate for mechanisms like HCI and BTI. So HCI or hot carrier injection, also known as hot carrier degradation, is simply um, the injection of channel carriers into the dial into the dielectric due to the electric fields present in the channel. Um, BTI bias temperature instability is, is a slightly different mechanism where the silicon hydrogen bonds at the at the interface break due to the vertical field across the dielectric. And 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 there is some recovery possible when the field is removed because some of the traps will collapse. So both mechanisms generate fixed charges and interface traps, which end up degrading the transistor performance over time. However, uh, it's it's not something that will happen constantly. And so here's here's an example um, of just a basic CMOS inverter with, with its corresponding waveform. Um, and, and so NMOS HCI only occurs during the falling edge when, when current is flowing through the, the end channel device. And PMOS HCI, on the other hand, occurs during the rising edge when the current is flowing through the P channel device. Um, and then when when the P P channel gate is high, we will see NBTI, so the negative bias uh, temperature instability. But but at that point, there is no field across the NMOS, so there'll be some recovery there. And then conversely, when the when when the input is low, or when the output is low, um, it will go the other way. Um, the NBTI will start recovering, and and the PBTI will start degrading. So so what this can, what this lets you do then is is Looking at at the frequency and the slew rates and 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 how sharp or how flat the rising and falling edges are, one can work out what's known as an AC DC ratio. So the the DC time then becomes a very small fraction of of the overall lifetime, and 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 so from a certification standpoint, that then suffices. And then this is also taken into account with respect to aging, margining, and modeling, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so, so electro migration, on the other hand, uh, has a little different way of approaching it. So, so with with back end of line scaling, we we do see you know narrower and thinner lines, so which leads to reduced EM margins. So, so here's an example where, as with technology scaling, the the max DC current that the metal one line at each of these nodes can support has reduced much faster than what the transistor ID sat. So this now leads to a mismatch between what the transistor outputs as current and what the line can sustain. And so the obvious solution would be to make lines wider, but that that leads to an area penalty. Um, so to deal with that, as I mentioned earlier, we can use the concept of mission profile. Now, with, with electro migration, we're, we're somewhat fortunate in that it has high activation energies. So the, the, the scaling with temperature becomes very, very rapid. Um, so in the case of aluminum, which is still used on the topmost layer uh, of the metallization, the activation energy is 0.7, whereas copper layers are in the 0.9 to 1.1 or even higher range. So when you when you take this into account, what happens is a lot of time that's spent at colder temperatures becomes insignificantly small and, and, and has a negligible impact. So the overall lifetime requirement becomes much shorter. And and with that said, one one can then trade off that margin to to 
offset some of this gap between the transistor current and the and the, the capacity of the interconnect wire to carry that current. So just like basically just building from these two examples, what we can we can co come up with is 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 a set of tools and methodologies that are collectively called design for reliability. So at, at a high level, the, there are two sets of data that are collected for technology certification. There are the basic intrinsic reliability testing results from the foundry. So that's typically done on scribe line test structures or, or, or arrays of devices and, and to provide the, the DC um, data and models. And then the next thing is the, the transistor or uh, aging data from a circuit level, such as using circuits such as ring oscillators that, that can either be done by the foundry and oftentimes also by the fabulous company if they've, if they've done test vehicles that have such structures and tested them in-house. So with that information, we can, we can construct a set of tools and, and flows that can help us check for reliability in the design. So for example, uh, several modes such as TDDB, PID, SM, EST, um, and latch up are handled through through specialized design rules. Uh, for electro migration, there are specialized tools and flows where the EM rules and checks are embedded into circuit simulations. For aging modes such as HCI and BTI, there are quasi static simulations uh, again, which which are integrated into the design flow. Additionally, there are electrical rule and safe operating area checks that allow designers to quickly assess during simulation if there are if there are uh, specific um, transients or spikes that could pose a reliability risk. And then finally, in the sea of gates, and some of this again comes from the ring oscillator data, this digital margin can be done based on experimental data collection with appropriate models and, and confidence limits. So all of that can be used to you know, translate the intrinsic reliability data from the technology development work into the design. So, so the question here would be, why do we do this? Well, you know, we, we obviously want to pass our in, intrinsic certification criteria to, to qualify the technology and make sure it's robust. And while that's absolutely critical and necessary, it's not sufficient. Because at the end of the day, fabulous companies like ours and many others don't sell technologies. That's what the foundry sell. We sell products. So, so designing, we, so we need to take the information from the technology and use it in our design flow and methodology to design reliable products. At the end of the day, our customers are going to come after us if there are issues, not, not go to the foundries directly, or at least not initially. So, so DFR basically then allows us to take the technology data and, and translate into design collateral to make reliability, reliable products. So, so the, here's a table of the various DFR approaches, and there's a lot of information on this page, so I'll, I'll, I'll move through it relatively quickly in the interest of time. Um, so, so starting with HCI and BTI, which are the aging modes, um, there are several techniques that can be used, which are you know the quasi-static aging simulation, which I talked about a little bit earlier, the digital margining, um, electrical rule checks, including overvolted checks, age models and corners, and lastly, product guard bands. And, and here, one of the key things that happens is it, it, it can vary considerably depending on, on design methodology and, and field requirements of quality and reliability. So again, this is information that the, the, the foundries typically don't have. And so it, it's incumbent upon the design companies to, to understand how these, these um, margins come, come about or, or what's needed and then share that learning with the foundries to, to optimize and improve the technology. The next category is time dependent dielectric breakdown and plasma induced damage, um, which both of which are handled through um, uh, physical design rules uh, in the case, uh, and then additionally in the case of TDDB with electrical checks. And so this is again something that we would typically expect to receive from the foundry, but it, it may it may in some cases end up being uh, extremely complex or prohibitive from a design efficiency standpoint. So it's it's incumbent to understand uh, 
how these rules are being used into design and, and feedback chat, you know, issues or challenges to the foundry and work with them to optimize the rules. Um, electro migration and stress migration uh, are handled through, so electro migration is handled through um, electrical rule checks, functional simulations and current checks. And stress migration is, is generally handled through uh, a collection of specialized design rules, physical design rules. Latch up and ESD are largely handled through um, specialized DRCs and design methodologies. Uh, single event effects, which we're not covering in, in a lot of detail in this talk, uh, is, is basically uh, the impact of radiation particles such as alpha particles from the package, cosmic neutrons, thermal neutrons, protons, and heavy ions that can cause bit flips uh, or transients and, and with and, and in the worst case, uh, functional interrupts and latch up. And so again, this is largely handled through design with by using techniques like ECC or parity in the SRAM, um, radiation hardened logic, and which which is often used in avionics and space applications, uh, triple modular logic redundancy. So essentially, you have three flops that collect the same input and and perform the same calculations, and you essentially. If, if if the three don't give you the same result, then you look for a majority vote. And, so, and, uh, and the premise that it's very unlikely for two flops in the same path to fail the exact same way due to radiation. Additionally, at the product level, um, and in terms of the application, several D rates can be applied on the logic SCR, such as functional timing, architectural, and logical to, to better understand what the customer will see in their application. And, and then finally, specifically for mechanisms like single event latch up, uh, optimizing the well tie spacing, making sure that uh, devices are close to well ties or guard rings would help reduce the, the risk of latch up. And last but not the least, um, I just want to touch a little bit about self heating here. So, self heating isn't really a reliability mechanism, but but the effect of self-heating, which is especially a challenge with technologies like FinFETs, can, can lead to significant temperature increases that can then affect the operation and reliability of the circuit and basically exacerbate several of the modes shown above. Um, so that is handled through, um, to, through power management uh, by thermal throttling. There's a lot of work going on to incorporate uh, thermal sensors and aging sensors on the chip to, to um, make sure that the effects of self feeding and aging are understood. Um, the data collected for technology certification needs to account for self feeding. Uh, and then the aging and EM flows also need to account for the impact of self feeding. And in fact, um, the, even for EM, there's a lot of heat transfer coming from the device into the interconnect, which we'll talk about in a bit that can, can affect, um, the, the EM um, margining. And then there are techniques that can be done in, in, in the layout itself, such as insertion of dummy feds, breaking up the fin arrays into smaller uh, segments, heat sinks that can help mitigate self heating, but all of these come at a cost of area. So, so, so again, just like everything else we do in, in this industry, in our line of work, there are significant trade-offs in what have to be understood and optimized. So again, here, this would be a case where we can't simply take the foundries guidance blindly, but we have to interact with the foundry and try to understand what the trade-offs are and, and what the costs are of doing certain things. So a little bit more about quasi-static aging simulation. So essentially the idea is we would simulate aging shifts in the key transistor parameters for a given set of conditions, such as a, a PVT, which is essentially the process corners and voltage and temperature ranges, the time and you know the failure fracture failure fraction that's um, that's targeted. And the models would obviously depend on the, the transistor type, whether, you know, what the dielectric is, whether it's a core transistor or an IO transistor, the threshold voltage and the geometry. Um, and, and the reason it's called quasi-static is you take an arbitrary waveform and divide it into a, several tiny time slices. And, and the idea is that within each time slice, the voltage is reasonably static and and so you compute the damage over that slice 
do that for each slice in the simulation and then extrapolate that to the field lifetime, assuming that the simulation is, is repeated over the life of the product. And so the way you do that is you, st you start off with, with a time zero simulation using fresh devices, to go through this aging flow, obtain the aging shifts and, 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 and replace the fresh devices in the necklace with age devices and then do an age simulation and, and compare the, the time zero versus end of life performance. If that's within spec, so i.e. The, the performance of the circuit is within the specification at the end of life, then the aging is considered acceptable. If it's not, then something needs to be changed. Either the voltages need to be changed or the design needs to be changed and, and reassessed. And, and here's kind of an example of what it looks like. So in this case, uh, this particular uh, waveform can be seen to distort over time and shift over to the right, which is, which is classic aging behavior. And so this will then lead to some degradation in the performance of the circuit, whatever, the, whatever that metric may be. And so the designer needs to run these simulations, extrapolate those to the field lifetime, compare the performance and decide if, if that's okay or something needs to change. And, and from a technology standpoint, then it becomes critical to make sure that the models are robust and, and applicable over the entire range of operation. And so what, what we simulate then is, is a good indication of what we would expect to see in the field. And, and there's been several challenges in cases where <clears throat> if the models are too pessimistic, that's not good because it leads to over-designing, which is, which is going to a non-competitive or an uncompetitive uh, position. But if the models are overly optimistic, then you can have field failures and, and that's not good either. So, so again, as with everything else we do, we have to right size this. Um, so a little bit more on EM. So EM can be handled a few different ways. So there are, EM is really a collection of three different um, types of checks. So the, the IDC checks is, is what, what's classical electromigration, where the failure is defined as a resistance increase beyond beyond a certain threshold, typically 10% or 20%. It's extremely sensitive to temperature. As I mentioned earlier, it has a very high activation energy. But in addition to the classical EM, there are a couple of other modes, such as the, the, the RMS current, which, um, which leads to joule heating. So that's just heat buildup in the wire, which, which then degrades the, the IDC limits. So this needs to be accounted for in the design flow. And then there's I peak, which is basically you've run so much current that you've blown the line apart and, and you know, it's catastrophic damage. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's rules and, and the methodologies to check all of this. Um, and then there are other things that can be done in, with respect to EM in terms of looking at capacitance loads and, and, and rise and fall times to try to see if, if, if some of these things can be optimized in the design. In addition, there are a couple of other knobs we can use for EM to, to obtain relief. So the first one is, is what's known as the black effect. So it's a, it's a short length relief where the very short wires, this, the stress gradient uh, is sufficiently large that it can retard EM. And we can then use that to allow higher current limits. And similarly, um, for short wires, the, the heat dissipation from the ends of the wires is no longer negligible relative to the, uh, the sides of the wires, and, and that can then be used to allow higher RMS current. And finally, um, the use of stacked vias for, for improved heat dissipation can, can, help, can help provide a little bit more margin for EM. So, but all of this requires, again, layout optimization and, and, uh, and, and knowledge of what can be done and what, what's possible with by doing these okay so switching gears now moving on to extrinsic reliability and product quality uh so as i mentioned earlier extrinsic reliability is the the early part of the backed up code where we can have high fallout but but again the good news is that there's there's a lot of techniques that can be implemented to screen screen those and, and the most commonly used techniques are high voltage stress tests HVST or burn-in. And the idea is that before shipping the part to the customer, we, we run these tests either at higher voltage and or higher temperature using basic testing such as BIS scan uh, to, to try to accelerate and provoke these latent defects. 
that would then fail in house as opposed to a few months into the field life. Um, so the conditions for this test have to be optimized on various uh, using various factors. So we obviously don't want to be anywhere close to intrinsic device breakdowns. Um, so that we don't we don't so the test itself doesn't cause the products to fail. And and then there may also be limitations related to the product and the tester hardware in terms of how much current it can sustain or how much power it can draw. Uh, and again, the, the idea is that we don't want to blow up parts in the test. We want to find the real failures, but not create our own failures with, with these tests. And then there are other tests. The tests themselves are, are you know, much more complex than I'm stating here. There's, there's, uh, you can have you know, sequential tests that can be static and or dynamic, and, and that really means whether the you know the circuits are toggling or not toggling. So the way we do this is once the voltage and temperature conditions are established, then loop studies can be done to establish the time. And so here's again a simple example. There's five tests and and it's just loops of five at a time, and it's basically just repeating the testing. You can see here in this example that beyond 15 loops, there are no more failures. So at that point, one could say that you know either 15 or maybe 20 is is a sufficient loop count to do the HPSC. And obviously, there's a the cost here in terms of test time and test resources. So we can't keep going indefinitely, and we also don't want to do indefinitely indefinite testing, even if resources were not an issue. Because as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to have walking wounded parts that we we weaken the parts so much that they end up then failing in the field, or and or we don't want to get to the other side of the backup curve and, and have this cause intrinsic reliability failures. So, so this is again very design dependent and, and this obviously some technology components, but, but a lot of this learning comes from the product testing that then needs to be fed back to the foundry. So this is a, a key source of finding extrinsic defects that can then be relayed back to the foundry with FA and 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 here a fabulous company can then collaborate with the foundry to improve the process so we we do need to simulate the design at these conditions to make sure again that we don't do something something crazy and and cause the part to blow up because there's some race condition or something strange that happened in the design so this then requires that the models uh, that we get from the foundry are are applicable and effective at these conditions and we also want to consider the intrinsic reliability impact since there's a, a small amount of aging that happens during this. In general, it tends to be pretty small if the HVST is set up correctly, but it, it's, it's something that needs to be considered as part of bringing up the technology and the product. So here's kind of a simple example of product qualification. So once, with, once HVST is done, the intrinsic reliability pieces of the technology are done and the product is up and running, it's taped out, the qualification starts. So there's, there are pretty standard uh, sample sizes that are used. So this is actually in the AEC standard, but it's, it's, it's you know, commonly um, used as an industry standard. And so H dollar high temperature operating life is, is a stress test that is set up to exercise the full product lifetime. ELF or early life failure rate is is essentially uh, set up to look at the first few months to maybe a year of lifetime. And they typically run the same uh, stress conditions. It's just that the durations are very different. And, and, and in this example, let's say if we allow zero fails with this sample sizes for an equivalent field life uh, of 10 years for HTOL and one year for ELFR, then what we can see here is, sorry, I got to keep moving my camera. What we can see here is that with you know with confidence limits using chi squared statistics, we, we end up seeing a PPM resolution of hundreds to maybe a thousand PPM, even though we allow zero fail. And this is just putting a confidence bound since you know we don't have infinite samples. So as you can see here, that these numbers are actually pretty high for for most applications, even, even industrial and, and maybe even for consumer and, and definitely for automotive. Um, so that's the problem. So with with the with the product qualification, we can never really get to low PPM resolution if, if the quality requirements demand that. Um, and and that's that's understood. You know, and, and it's not possible to simply say, oh, let's let's do thousands of more parts. Right? We we work two to three orders of magnitude away from you know demonstrating single digit PPM. So that's that's really not practical. 
Um, and so there's other techniques that have to be used to, to, to get to low PPM, but you can't really show it with just a basic product qualification. Uh, now, this, this table only shows two tests, but there are several other tests uh, that look at package robustness, ESG, and LATCHA, which I really won't go into. Um, and, and again, with the sample size, we, we also have time constraints because if at some point we want to start shipping the product and you know meet the customer direct schedules and, and, and also hopefully make money, we, we can just test indefinitely. So, so a bit more needs to happen here than just to base a basic qual. Now, again, this falls into the necessary but not sufficient bucket. And so here's an example of, of how a stress condition is set. So let's say if the operating condition is one volt um, and the temperature is an effect of 95, this could be a consumer or an industrial application. We would stress at an elevated voltage and an elevated temperature. And, and so both of these cause an acceleration. And there are different models that and parameters that can either be obtained from empirical studies or literature or from prior technologies. And when you scale for this, you get a couple of acceleration factors. So when you, when you multiply these two, you get the overall lifetime acceleration. So, so in, in the case of an HDAL, uh, a six week stress is pretty typical. So that works out to just over a thousand hours. And, and with, with with an acceleration setup that looks something like this, that ends up to about 11.2 years of field life. Um, so, so if the if the product specification calls for a 10 year field life, then something like this covers it. Um, now, at at this point, it might be tempting to think, well, you know, even six weeks sounds a really long time. Uh, why not do it faster? And you can, right? You can go to you know, 1.4 volts or 150 C and get much more acceleration. So there, there's a couple of reasons not to do that. One is you you don't want to over accelerate because um, then you end up with atypical failure modes that will never be seen during field life. You know, it's it's kind of the old analogy of you know if if a, if a chick incubates an egg for you know several days at whatever 37 40 C, you get you, or, or, or you get a check out of it, right? But if you if you if you break that egg on a skillet at well over 100 C, then you get an omelet in a few minutes. You don't you don't get a check in a few minutes, right? So so you don't want to do that. Um, and and also at some point again, you don't want to get to to a regime where you're seeing intrinsic breakdowns because you're at extremely high voltages or temperatures that cause failures that then derail your qualification, but they're not something that you would expect in normal field life. And, and again, as shown in this example, you, you want to ideally have both a voltage acceleration and a temperature acceleration so that both both acceleration effects are, are working in, in concert with each other to, to really give you a good sense of what the field risks for quality and reliability are. And while this example was for HL, ELFR is generally very similar. The difference is it's a much shorter duration because you're only looking at the first few months to say maybe a year at most of field life. And you do have a larger sample size, but it's a very short stress. Uh, so in addition to this, a company may still decide to go further out than, than what the requirements are to understand how much margin there is and how much robustness the technology has. Now, overall, again, this is not something that the foundry will see a lot of. So foundries typically do a qual with SRAM, and, and while an SRAM is definitely very useful and, and, and can show a lot of good things, a, lo a lot of the issues that you expect with logic or analog circuitry will not be exposed with an SRAM qual. And so it's 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 incumbent on the foundry then to also look at logic test vehicles, but but at the same time, a design company that is stressing its own product will, will learn a lot from from studies like this. So that's something that needs to be conveyed back to the foundry to address the issue and improve the process. So here's a big fishbone that I won't really go into gory detail. But so as I mentioned earlier with the with the standard quals, we we can only see resolutions of hundreds to maybe a thousand ppm at best. So if we need to get to single digit PPM or even sub PPM level reliability, how do we do that? And so there's a collection of best practices that's, that are shown here um, that come from the technology, uh, 
test screens, manufacturing best practices, look ahead calls, design and DFX practices, IP validation and characterization ahead of the product introduction, uh, burn-in and HVSD studies, and then safe launch studies where there's much more inspection and screening to, to really understand the different risks that can happen in the field and then take the learning back into improving the process. So, so a lot of some of this is obviously done by the foundry, but a lot of this is done by the at the product level and the IP level. So it needs to go back into the foundry foundry's uh, workflow. The knowledge needs to be shared from the design company back to the foundry to approve um, to improve the process and as as can be seen this is a pretty complex multidisciplinary approach to to improving quality and reliability so now we have the key challenges in the advanced nodes and these are just a selection there's these are by no means exhaustive uh, but before we go there let's let's pause as we said earlier and see if there are any questions that i can try to answer Cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So I have a bunch of questions um, um, that people have uh, um, have been asking. Um, so I'll, I'll make this short. It's just in the interest of time. So I think you still have a little bit of uh, material. Yeah, I just realized it's, uh, we only have ten minutes. Sorry. Oh, that's that's, that's fine. Minutes. That's okay. I, it's okay to go over. I, I think folks don't mind here. Um, one question is related to negative activation energies, right? So um, I mean, a, a negative activation energy just simply means that things get better at at higher temperatures and lower temperatures, but physically, you know, can you give some examples of, of um, like actual reliability phenomena and mechanisms where that's the case? Yeah, so historically it's been, um, we've seen that with HCI, uh, most recently with the IO transistor at longer channel lengths, but as the channel lengths get shorter, the, the dominant mechanism changes to electron-electron scattering and we start seeing positive activation energies, but but even even for some of the early generation FinFET technologies, we've seen negative activation energies. Got it. Okay. And another question uh, uh, relates to, um, uh, um, you know, aging simulations. I mean, is this something that could be done across an entire product or, uh, or just, the, you know, are, are there simulation flows being done to try to enable um, a much broader, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, just like a much broader scope where many more transistors or, or modules are being uh, assessed for reliability as opposed to uh, a more uh, transistor level spice based type simulation. No, so it's it's kind of in between, right? The, the, the compute requirements of aging simulations can get very, very challenging. So, you know, especially when you have large advanced SOCs, no, but for a lot of older generation analog circuits, it's 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 not as as difficult. But typically, when we do aging simulations, it's done at the IP or the circuit level. Got it. Okay. Uh, another question um, uh, relates to uh, uh, H tall. Can it be done only at high temperature? Well, so H tall. The H stands for hot, right? But there is, I, I didn't really get into that. There is a counterpart to H tall called L tall, which is uh, stressing done at cold. And, and and historically, again, that was done for mechanisms like HCI, which was worse at cold. But but really, on on, on more advanced and complex uh, nodes and products, it there's not a whole lot you can learn from H tall that you cannot just simply do with aging simulations. Got it. Got it. Uh, so um, another question, when you talk about reliability requirements, what standards are you following? Um, how are the acceptable confidence intervals, allowable failure rates, et cetera, determined and who does so? So that's that's a good question. It's, it's So 1000 PPM is kind of a de facto industry standard for consumer and industrial. Um, automotive is a little different because there's just a, such a wide range of applications. You have chips that sit on the engine block um, where a failure can cause a crash and injuries or even death. And then you have chips that are in the dashboard that run the infotainment system where failure may be annoying, but not necessarily a problem. Um, and so a lot of that varies depending on, on the application and the requirements. So with, especially with automotive, there's, there's differences in terms of the robustness of the design when it comes to parts that are used in functional safety applications versus non-safety applications. 
but but at the end of the day it's it's really what what the application is what the customer requirements are and and so it's between the design company and the customer got it okay and uh, just one last question in the interest of time can voltage acceleration be used for auto qual uh, as far as the uh, uh, attendees can uh, aware uh, AEC standard does not allow for voltage acceleration the the AEC standard is basically you know the, the grades are focused on the temperature range of operation it 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 doesn't explicitly forbid it, at least if, if I remember correctly, but it's it's really left up to the individual companies and how they stress and call. Got it. Okay. Anyways, uh, Mehul, um, I, I think you better resume the rest of your presentation, and then uh, um, and then we'll come back yeah. and take more questions. Yeah. Thanks. No, sorry, I totally lost track of time. So no, 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 no. no. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thanks. So you. again, this, this is just a collection of challenges. These are interesting and significant, but not necessarily a comprehensive list. There's obviously much more that is not covered here. So I'll talk about five challenges before concluding the talk. Uh, so the first one is self-heating. Um, and this is again, the device just heating up when, when current flows. Uh, and it's, it's an especially severe issue with fin fats because of poor heat dissipation through the substrate. Um, so you can see here the fin is pretty narrow. And so there's a pretty narrow pathway to dissipate heat through the substrate, which is how it's typically be, has been the case for uh, planar devices. So instead, since the heat can't get through the substrate quickly, it actually moves up through the source strain contacts into the interconnect, it's, you know, in, in the uh, perpendicular to the plane of the slide. And, and as a result of that, uh, because of the heat buildup, and since most temperature mechanisms are fairly sensitive to temperature, the impact of self-heating needs to be comprehended on its intrinsic reliability and, and, and aging and EM. Um, there's things that can be done to mitigate, as we touched upon earlier, by breaking up the fin arrays, having dummy fingers, uh, having uh, heat sinks, etc. But they all cost area, so the trade-off needs to be understood. So here are some examples. Uh, the first two are from literature, and the, the third is from some simulations we've done. So in, starting with this pie chart, um, in, in the case of a bulk fin fat, less than 1% in, in this particular uh, study uh, went through the, the body and everything else went through the, the interconnects. And you can see here uh, for a handful of different transistor score and ION MOS and PMOS, uh, as the power increase, you know, as would be obvious, the temperature increases. And in, in some cases, it can get pretty significant. We're talking about tens and maybe even hundreds of degrees. Um, and you can see this with these simulations, it's, it's sensitive to the frequency. So if you have if we have extremely uh, high frequencies, then it quickly steady states, and it's still about you know 60 to 65 degrees. Um, for lower frequencies, it'll it'll move much more rapidly with the frequency, and and you know while the average still remains about the same, you can get peaks of as much as you know over 100 degrees. So that's extremely significant from a reliability standpoint, as well as from a performance standpoint. Um, Another topic then is IO scaling. So, in a lot of cases on the board, the the microprocessor or the microcontroller needs to support higher voltages to be able to talk to peripheral ICs that may be built with older generation technologies. Uh, however, with with fin pit scaling, it's it's hard to get a thick dielectric into the the replacement gate integration, and so that that requires a thinning of the dielectric. So it it essentially means you have a lower voltage. Um, uh, IO and so here's basically a very simple circuit uh, schematic of an IO, in this case a 1.8 volt IO built with native 1.8 volt transistors. But 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 if the, uh, the transistor itself can't support a higher voltage because of the integration challenges, but it needs to be able to support higher voltages for communication with other chips. Then the solution is to make stacked IO. So. At a very basic level, the idea is that you, you put two transistors to do the function of one and, and divide up the voltage. But this, this brings its own, own challenges. So the, from a design efficiency standpoint, the devices are not, both the paired devices are not always on all the time. And so you might have one device that's on first and typically it might be the one closer to the pad that, that bears the brunt of the voltage, and only when the voltage reach, reaches a certain level, which may be above the nominal level, because again, from a design efficiency standpoint, you don't want to switch too often. Um, you get into, uh, and it's only then that the second device would turn on. So, so that over time can lead to differential aging. Um, this is also a case where 
because the nominal voltage of the IO is higher, this, this then brings in brings up challenges about what the HVST and burn in voltages should be. And this can expose uh, weaknesses in, in, in the technology that may not be seen with uh, lower voltage devices. And, and again, this may be something that the design company does where the foundry may not have uh, information about. So, so learning from this thing can go back to the design uh, to the foundry for uh, for uh, analysis and improvement of the process. So, so, so a stacked IO at the end of the day will have unique intrinsic and extrinsic issues that need to be comprehended. So here's an example um, of, of, of something where we, we discovered an extrinsic reliability issue with with uh, with IOs, and so in this case we had a breakdown between the gate, uh, the gate and the source train across the spacer, and the solution was basically to make the spacer wider and then re-engineer the transistor to recover the lost performance. Um, this issue was inherent to the technology, but it wasn't. Um, it's not something that's uh, seen on the core transistor, even though the spacer width is the same, because the core transistor with the thinner dielectric has a much lower intrinsic breakdown, so the, the gate dielectric would generally fail before the spacer failed. But but for the IO transistor, the intrinsic breakdown was higher, and so it we could see this mechanism. Uh, and 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 this was actually correlated to uh, test structure data from from scribeline test structures, which I'll touch upon in a couple of slides. So, so the key takeaway here is that it's it's extremely critical to to stress IOs adequately during HVST or and and product qualification to expose these kinds of issues. Um, another challenge is the middle of line reliability. So again, with 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 gate bit scaling, uh, the contact module is essentially completely re-architected on FinFET uh, and in even. 28 nanometers and below. Um, so the, the industry has moved to self-aligned contacts with extremely complex integration. And those of you that remember local interconnect, well, it's essentially back in a different um, way now through uh, for FinFETs. Um, and, and with that, uh, this again has its unique uh, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic issues. So from an intrinsic standpoint, um, you can have two breakdown pathways through either the spacer or through the gate cap, and that can uh, cause a bimodality in the in the probability distribution of the intrinsic failures, which is often represented by a Weibull. In this case, it's not really a single Weibull. Um, and so, so the effect of these two modes and their respective uh, uh, Weibull parameters needs to be comprehended as part of the technology qualification. And then the extrinsic issues, um, so here are some examples actually from literature which show a breakdown between um, gate to uh, the source strain contact or between the ESIGI, which is often used for performance enhancement of PFETs to, to gate. Um, that again, so, so this again has to be comprehended and, and maybe an SRAM test vehicle may not be adequate to do this. So a lot of this requires product qualification or logic test vehicles. Um, so here's the dielectric breakdown that I mentioned. So this first one is, is a gate dielectric. Uh, this is the same issue I talked about a couple of slides ago. So initially we had this extrinsic distribution, so an intrinsic changing to an extrinsic. To, so this was the intrinsic breakdown and then the extrinsic because of the breakdown across the spacer. And then after the process was improved, it, it got much better when we essentially cleaned up the extrinsic tail. Uh, here's a different example from, and this time from an interconnect dielectric where again, we had an extrinsic breakdown uh, um, caught with uh, monitoring scribe line test structures. And, and a lot of this is volume data from several wafers run over a period of months to, to see this. And you can see from the from the y axis that these are pretty low uh, fallout in terms of percentages, but, but this translates to tens to hundreds of ppm that is not acceptable in the field as a failure. So unless we catch it and screen it, our customers will see this and this will be bad for everyone. So here, same thing, as we fixed the process, we were able to clean up the distribution. And then a third example, back to the gate dielectric, where we started off with an intrinsic uh, component and an extrinsic tail. And here, further analysis showed that the extrinsic fallout was primarily in the center of the wafer and at the notch of the wafer. And, and this, this map shows the site averages, this shows the site minima, and we essentially saw the same thing. Now, it turned out that the, the two 
signatures here were actually different mechanisms, and, and, and so we required different sets of process fixes to address them. And so here, the key thing is just collecting a lot of data across the way for uh, making sure you, you get as much coverage as possible. So the standard nine side or 13 side testing is not sufficient to see these kinds of signals. So at least for the first few years until the process is mature, it's it's a good idea to get all site or checkerboard data and, and really see what kind of distributions we have and whether there are tails. Because if 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 this happens in a test structure, well, it's going to happen somewhere in a product. And, and if you if you don't have the screens in place, it's a customer failure waiting to happen. And obviously you don't want to take the hit in screening and yield loss all the time. So this does need to go back to the foundry for addressing the issue. Um, and then the next thing I want to talk about, I'm sure folks would be familiar with the sources of variation that's been, you know, a constant challenge in the industry right from its early days, right? But with, especially with the advanced nodes and the complex processing, it's it's extremely significant. So there are multiple sources of local variation, uh, especially with, with the FinFed architecture. Uh, there are several layout dependent effects, uh, process loading effects such as deposition, etch, and epitaxy, and this this can be very interesting uh, and can vary from product to product depending on things like a digital heavy product versus a product with with significant analog content. Um, so if if you're using a lot of I/O devices, then the loading effects can look very different compared to. Um, a very digital circuit with, with very little IO usage. Then there's long range density gradients such as CMP and uh, rapid thermal annealing, uh, thermal gradients due to localized heating and, and, and different power dissipation uh, metrics for different IP blocks on the on the chip. Uh, stresses from the package. And then mechanisms such as uh, one over F noise and RTN. Um, so why is this important? Well. This needs to be accounted for in the modeling. So, even if many of these mechanisms don't directly impact aging, they they introduce uncertainty in the time zero behavior. And and so, if you're starting with with an uncertain uh, position, then the the end result with the aging simulation will also create a certain degree of uncertainty. So, it needs to be accounted for uh, in 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 the in the design flow. So with respect to aging, the models that we typically have of, are basically extremely deterministic. So it's a function of you know, voltage time and temperature and you know, failure rate and geometry and whatever, but we typically don't have stochastic components. The, the impact of the stochastic component can be pessimistic or optimistic, neither of which is desirable, because if, if they're very pessimistic, then we risk over-designing our circuits. If they're highly optimistic, then we could have a risk in the field that we did not comprehend in our design. Additionally, for specialized uh, match circuits, such as current mirrors, uh, within reason, the absolute shift due to aging is less critical than relative differences over time. Uh, so the mismatch due to aging is often worse than the absolute amount of aging. Uh, we also know that depending on circuit operation, not all the transistors will age equally, and then not all of them impact the circuit performance equally. Several effects actually cancel each other out stochastically. So very often, if you want to get to, um, a, say, a 1 ppm um, metric at the circuit level, you may determine that you don't really need to be 1 ppm at the transistor level. So where all this ends up is that it's, 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 it's a good idea to use Monte Carlo models to help uh, assess and mitigate such issues. and and going even one step further, uh, the idea of template-based layout for analog circuits. Now, this is something that's been in place for digital circuits for a long time. There's you know, standard cells and foundation IP that are pretty much used unchanged by uh, designers and often they're provided by uh, specialized IP design houses or even by the foundry. But, but the idea of taking that and extending it to analog circuits is extremely useful because then that template-based layout can be uh, tested and adequately assessed prior to its its introduction into a product. So here's an example uh, that I'll go quickly over. So so this is um, a fairly simple schematic of a high speed differential amplifier that's that's used in uh, um, commonly used in thirties receivers. Um, and, and it generally has high bandwidth requirements, so that requires the use of minimum uh, channel and devices. But that means extremely small area um, of the transistor. 
So that leads to a high input referred offset, uh, which 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 is then calibrated out uh, through a state machine um, that is used to compensate for that. So so here um, the the range of offset correction should ideally be be obtained through Monte Carlo simulation to take into account both the time zero and the the aging uh, uncertainties. And and again, just like as I've been saying before, you. If you if you overdo it, then uh, that if if the models are too pessimistic and the correction is overdone, then that leads to a reduction in the bandwidth and the performance of the circuit. On the other hand, if it's not done adequately or if it's if it's insufficient, then you risk having bit errors in the field that can cause failures or poor performance. Um, then here's an example that I'll quickly touch upon that actually show, shows some of these challenges kind of coming together. So this was on a FinFET technology uh, where an issue was discovered during a product qualification uh, in a dual stack IO. So this was a, a 1.8 volt I, uh, transistor in, in a higher voltage operation. So we had some local variations where the space between the source train connection and the fin array varied from the center of the array to the edge of the array with the edge being lower. Um, and and because of this, uh, we we had breakdowns here at the edge, as you can see here, during stressing. Um, now, simply increasing this, redesigning the layout with increasing the space, you know, even setting aside the the expense of of uh, and the reticles and everything is not uh, viable because it it led to other design rule violations. So effectively, the circuit had to be redesigned to um, not have higher voltages and. and and, and, and there was a design element to it where there were voltage spikes during the design. So that was how this had to be addressed to make sure that we don't have the squall failures. Okay, so I will now conclude my talk and I know I've probably run over, so thank you for your patience. Um, so bottom line, the technology is going to continue to evolve to newer architectures and use new, newer materials to push power performance in area. Um, we can only expect that the reliability and quality requirements will be more stringent as, as semiconductor chips and applications get even more pervasive. Um, in terms of design, of designing parts with the re required uh, quality and reliability requirements, uh, we need to consider mission profiles, application use, core, uh, use cases, uh, IP workloads, so packet stresses and across chip thermal gradients. And a lot of this information comes from the design company and, and needs to be fed back into the found, to the foundry for for improvements. Um, and 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 it's it's extremely crucial to impact the assess uh, or to assess the impact of variation and have better modeling for uh, variability to ensure that there's more robust margining for reliability. And and a lot of these DTCO and DFR practices and methodologies um, will will obviously remain and become even more critical and, and it'll require closer and closer collaboration among the various stakeholders and between design companies and foundries. And lastly, I want to thank several colleagues, so uh, Chiman and Ning for valuable discussions and putting this talk together and then several different teams uh, across NXP and, and across our, our foundry and IP partners that work on these things and, uh, you know, been on the journey with us as we uncovered and addressed these issues. So it's it's as I mentioned earlier, it's 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 this is DTCO. It's it's basically everyone involved early on and everyone working with everyone else. Uh, the last two slides are just the list of references, so I won't go over that. And and with that, I will conclude. Thank you all for your time, and I'm happy to take a few more questions if we have time. Behul, thanks so much. Um, excellent presentation. Uh, I did have a question that came in uh, that didn't get a chance to answer uh, asked uh, in the intermission. So if you've got, for instance, like dynamic voltage frequency scaling in different IPs, for instance, when you've got different CPUs operating um, at high voltages and other CPUs operating at low voltage, how do you handle, um, you know, when you've got uh, different parts being stressed at uh, different conditions in terms of reliability? Um, yeah, so that that's a great question. I think I think that, that you can do it in, in a couple of different ways, right? You can you can divide up the qual and and handle and do kind of IP level readouts with with the different stress conditions, right? That's one thing. 
And then uh, another way is to ensure that that's accounted for the, in terms of the modeling. Um, a third option is uh, to the extent you have dedicated IOs for the different circuits, you can always run different stress voltages for the different circuits. Now, obviously that greatly complicates the, the stress program. And so it's, it's a fair bit of work at that point, but that's again, a good example of collaboration between the design technology and product teams early on. Got it. Okay. So in the interest of time, I think uh, uh, we're, we're, we're 12 minutes over. So I just want uh, right, like return. I don't see other questions um, uh, 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 flagging um, in the Q and A and chat windows. I uh, would like to thank you again for um, this very informative tutorial and also uh, additional information on how uh, reliability and quality is impacting our daily lives and and uh, also um, uh, in these very, very uh, uh, critical um, applications such as auto. I really appreciate your uh, time, Mehul, and uh, um, you know, hope everyone stays well. Uh, we will announce our uh, next uh, talk, uh, which is scheduled for sometime in July um, uh, shortly. Okay? Great. Yeah, thank you for having me. I enjoyed this, and thanks again, Alvin, for working with me on this.